speaker seminar series and just uh, not because I joined late. I'm not sure Julian told or not. Just uh, let you know that we are recording this session and will be available later on. If you have any concern, please let us know. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Graham Plasto and it was my honor to work with Graham for a long time. And he was my former supervisor, but still it's he is my mentor. And Graham is CEO for Livestock Gentech. As I know, Livestock Gentech at the University of Alberta established to kind of to transfer uh, the research results that get into the industry. And as I know, we have had a successful program through the Livestock Gentech. And Graham was one of those people that early adopter for the genomics, as I remember. He was kind of the, those early person that used the PCR technology to do some work on the genomic side. And he has done many work on the genomics and uh, metabolomics and you, you, you call it omics. So then he has a great experience working with industry for, I believe, for 25 years and about the 15 years working in academia with many publications and many trainees, including myself and uh, he, yes, he has really great impact on the beef and the pork industry in Canada and, and probably in the world, I would say. Grant, please just to go ahead and the floor is yours and uh, go ahead, please. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and it's great to uh, be with you today. I apologize for, for not being there in person. Um, but anyway, let's see, um, let's talk a little bit about um, omics. And I'm going to focus on beef and pork. Uh, let's, I was I was recalling. I think it's more. It's at least 20 years that I was in Truro last. But I was also thinking this morning. Well, what what was my first job? I don't know why. I did. Don't try and calculate because you won't. We used to begin working very young in England. I, I assure you. But my first job was actually. Um, at the world's largest duck breeding company. I was still at school, by the way. But uh, so maybe that set me down this uh, road of working with animals. So just a few things. I, I'm going to talk about some of these companies. So I just thought I'd better say this. I am a director of a company called Alpha Phenomics, and I'll also be talking about technology <laughs> from a company called Animal Inframetrics. I'm also a member of the Ag Sites Board of Directors, um, but there are other uh, organizations who do some of the things we're going to be talking about. And we have funding from a lot of industry organizations, as Garda just mentioned. So very briefly, well, what is Livestock Gentech? It's a not-for-profit center and focused on developing genomic technologies for the livestock industry and developing those technologies, but all, also trying to get them adopted. Um, and that's part of, of what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, I have put this here because it's my last slide, but you never know, I may not get there. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our collaborators all around the world. And you can see a, a large number of organizations that have funded some of the work that I'm going to be talking about. And when I'm teaching, I always try and, and tell our students how exciting it is to work in, in agriculture. That's why I'm still doing it, I think, is because it is so fundamental to, to the world and the opportunity is huge. And there's an old slide here talking about increasing population, uh, increasing energy demand, climate change, of course, and the prediction that we'll need twice as much food as we were producing an old slide. But in the 35 years, having to double food production if population is continue, going to continue to grow. And of course, livestock, um, despite all of the, uh, the alternatives, is livestock is going to be a big part of world agriculture in that period. And so there are a number of challenges. One is doubling uh, production, but another one is, of course, antibiotic resistance and, and how that, how livestock production is part of um, 
that issue. So again, lots of lots of things that we we need to work on. And the other opportunity, I've got a few slides just to introduce that is often when we look at animals, it's they look very similar. And you'll see that theme as we as we go through the talk. So if we look at these two animals, are probably Charolais cows. Um, who is the who is the healthiest or who is the most efficient? We can't necessarily say. So how can we look under the hive, as it were? And that's one of the things that uh, genomics has been able to do, of course, is the genetic potential of an animal is there in the animal's DNA. And that DNA uh, can be analyzed even before birth and right through to when, if an animal is a beef animal, it hits our plate. So there is something that we can track there. And that's a little bit uh, about today's seminar. But my favorite geneticist or animal breeder, I should say, was an Englishman from the 18th century, Robert Bakewell. And he was once asked, um, what is the, the secret of, of um, the way you're developing these new um, varieties or strains of animals? And he said, the whole of the art is in choosing the best males to the best females. And of course, what he meant by that was measuring the performance of the animals and then mating the, the best performing animals to, to make that improvement. So when I first came to uh, Canada, it was right at the start of um, what we think of as genome wide analysis. As Garda mentioned, I used to do single gene analysis a long time ago. But uh, the first year I was properly here in Canada was when we got the 50,000 SNP chip built. Uh, the, the U of A was involved in that development. And even then, you know, we were talking about the cost of genomics uh, decreasing. And so the tools are becoming more sophisticated, but to apply these tools, you really need to have information on the traits. So that's a that's really what I'm going to talk about today. So again, here's a couple of Hereford cattle or um, crossbred cattle. Um, you can't tell the difference. They're the very similar size, and this is work from uh, uh, cattle and feed yards. It was presented at the Gentech conference. Um, in 2003, not 2103. But you can see their initial body weights were the same, their growth rate was the same, but they got to the end point in a very different way. And so how can we select animals that are going to be more efficient? Something that's uh, very important as we go forward in terms of sustainability. Here's a pig example of combined lit litters here. Uh, but you can see most of these animals look very, very similar. And so what can we do to, um, to predict their uh, potential? And as I say, they, we can look at their DNA and we can begin to ask questions about um, what does it tell us about the potential of the animal? And where does genomics help? Well, the, the phrase we've used for many years now are for traits that are expensive or difficult to measure. So in the bottom left, you've got some pigs waiting to go into a, um, a feed intake recording uh, equipment, a fire station, as we call them. Um, costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time. Of course, you can only measure meat quality. There's an example there, uh, again, from pigs um, after slaughter. And one of the areas I'm particularly interested in, in cattle, but uh, all pigs, but also cattle is disease. And here you can see some pigs probably started out looking very similar like this. And in this case, you can see some differences. So here's a skinny pig. Here's a pretty uh, robust looking animal and another weak one here. And the difference is that these pigs have been exposed to disease. 
So they're, they're reacting to disease in a different way. So wouldn't it be cool to be able to know from the DNA who's going to um, respond to disease like this versus these animals? So the other part, which I'll probably take a lot for granted is, is what we do with genomic selection now. So we can use, we can analyze all of the, uh, all of the uh, genetic code of an animal, the whole genome sequence if we want to. And we can use what I've called here reference population. This is a slide from Filippo Viglio at the University of Guelph and Lactonet in terms of collecting both genotypes and phenotypes on many animals and then using that to train our DNA sequence to be able to select for the best animals for the next generation. So as it says there, using the SNP effects to estimate the genetic worth of individuals without any observations. So very powerful technology. So we can do all sorts of things, but wouldn't it be great to know a sire's ability, for example, to breed daughters that stay in the herd or to breed uh, animals who tolerate environmental or, or disease challenge, something that we, we call resilience nowadays. Wouldn't it be great to do that as soon as they're born? So, and why? Well, here's a, you know, the poster child of uh, the genomics age in livestock is, of course, the dairy industry, and there's lots of reasons for that, not just because the animals are kept indoors, but um, you can see the progress that's been made and the value that's been generated by applying genomics since uh, 2009, using that tool that was first developed uh, at the U of A with um, um, the USDA and Illumina and the University of Missouri. So fantastic uh, uh, progress that's been made. But it's a little bit harder in, in other species. To, I won't tell you why today dairy was easy. They'll kill me for saying that, of course. But here's some of the differences. So as we've said, genomics is most useful for the expensive and difficult to measure traits. So we need to get that. And, when you start out doing genomics, the traits that you have information on are the easy to measure ones. So the actual value of genomics, applying genomics is, is relatively small at the beginning. So you have to go out and, and start to do this large scale phenotyping. We, of course, the dairy industry does have different types of uh, breeds and uses them for different products, for example, or different environments as well. But in the Canadian beef industry, we use a relatively large range of breeds. So that means the, this step is a little bit harder. Instead of primarily working with a black and white cow, we're looking at very many different breeds. So that's one of the challenges. And the beef herd is crossbred and predominantly uses natural service. So again, the, the, the multiplication of genetics or the dissemination of genetics is very different. And that gives us challenges in the beef industry. Another, another uh, issue is it's not a supply managed industry like the dairy industry. And the beef value chain is relatively fragmented. So I always like the chain analogy because if a chain is going to work, if you think of a bicycle chain, then you have to oil it, okay, <laughs> or it, eventually it breaks. And in livestock value chains, that oil is, is often data. You're sharing data across the chain or you're uh, sharing value across the chain. That helps chains work. But the beef value chain is a little bit, um, well, it's fragmented and data sharing is an issue. So that also makes some of the things we could do uh, difficult. And of course, we have different environments and management systems that we need to take into account. If we think about pork, it's, it's similar. Um, 
one of the challenges in Pork, the second point there is that we, we do our uh, selection in pure uh, lines, pure breeds, and we do it in high health nucleus herds so that we can determine the genetic potential of the animals. But as we go down the uh, multiplication pyramid, the health, uh, it's harder to keep uh, high health status. So we get lower health uh, status as we go down, but again, we've got crossbreeding. So it's, that's another challenge. Now, one benefit, that's why I put it in green, is the pork value chain is, is relatively integrated. So it does work together. That's one of the reasons we're able to, uh, to um, make such improvement in the pig side. But again, it can be different environments and management systems. So what are the goals of, of the work that we're doing? Well, we're interested in how animals change over time, particularly how they respond to different environments or different nutrition, how they respond to stress or disease. And I've mentioned disease, but also um, in beef cattle, as with climate change, then we're seeing more heat domes or extreme temperature events which, which impact the animals. So we're interested in how can we measure the, uh, the response of animals to these stresses. Sort of going to the molecular level, how do the different domes that we can measure interact and how can we use them to improve our predictions? If you like, how can these signals allow us to talk with the animals? If you think of Dr. Doolittle, how can we get them to tell us what they're experiencing and uh, how they're reacting to these things and with the aim of improving production and sustainability? Very quickly, I, I probably don't have enough time to talk about all the examples, but resilience in the dictionary, it's the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. And if we think of disease, then it's a combination of uh, some different things. And we think of it, the ability of pigs to respond to pathogens in a way that minimizes the impact of disease. So they're going to get sick, but they recover quickly. And I'm sure if you're anything like me, that you know the variation that exists in people. If they get, if they get flu, some people take a long time to recover and other people go to sleep for 24 hours and, and they're up and running again. So how can we get a handle on that variation and use it in a sustainable and competitive production? Again, I don't have time to go through all the things we do, but um, we built a natural challenge model, which we've done a lot of work on. And I think that's one of the things I would say is right from the beginning, we've always recognized that if we're using these animals, it's an opportunity to take as many samples and as many phenotypes as we can, because the technology is going to improve over time. So if we're collecting blood samples, we collect blood samples at three points, actually four points, but three points here that we use to do all of these different molecular assays, RNA-seq, proteomics, metabolomics, microbiome, all of those things. So we build up a huge data set in this case, looking at how all of these animals respond to disease challenge. So thinking ahead, because when we started this work, there's no way we would have thought we could do RNA-seq or proteomics on 4,000 pigs. You know, that's, it would have cost far too much. But what we've seen over the last 15 years is, as we predicted, the cost of assays has reduced. So in fact, the most expensive part of what we do is actually phenotyping the animals. And so, what are the technologies that we're going to be using going forward to help us breed the animals that we need for the future? So just a, a few results. We, we built this natural challenge model because we, we wanted to mimic um, the commercial situation, uh, but collect all of these samples, which is difficult to do in a commercial environment. And uh, so we've done that. We found heritable variation, of course, for growth, for feed intake cur curves, but also mortality and morbidity. 
and some of them show uh, value as predictors of uh, phenotypic and genetic resilience. And ultimately, we want to be able to convert that to genomic prediction, taking into account that we're dealing with crossbred animals, purebred animals, but then what, how are they going to perform at the commercial level when in the crossbreds? So, and building that model, we're able to develop new technologies, or we have a model where we can capture phenotypes, but also look at new technologies. And here's an example. It's an infrared thermography or a heat map of the pigs. You can see the individual pigs. We can measure the temperature. And in the disease challenge that we set up, we, could, we found that the change in the temperature of the individual animals was a great early indicator of sickness. Uh, and it was earlier than feed intake. So one of the first reactions to all of us, humans included, is of course you get sick and you lose your appetite. So um, before the uh, pen walkers could see disease or before the animals stopped eating, we could see they're um, responding to disease by changing their body temperature. And as I say, Al Schaefer at Animal Infrometrics, who's been working on infrared thermography for a long time, is you can also use the same technique to, to begin to get an indication of their feed efficiency. So again, using infrared thermography, we're using the same technology to look at disease, but also um, predict the feed efficiency of animals. And it can be done, um, it's a one-off measurement. It can be done in seconds as opposed to growing animals for 70 or 80 days in a feed test. So just thinking about beef. So for the last 15 or so years, we've been uh, collecting our data on crossbred cattle because, as I say, that's the population we really want to improve. So we have genome sequence on more than 350 bulls, um, part of an international project. Uh, lots of genotypes, what we call high density genotypes, so we can impute to genome sequence. More than, well, probably 30,000 animals with predicted sequence, millions of SNPs now. But then importantly, uh, lots of records of dry matter intake, uh, feed efficiency, carcass traits, all of these things that cost a fortune to measure or take time, like mating opportunities in terms of predicting fertility or stayability in the herd. And more recently, and so, um, collecting information on methane emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, so that we can help select for animals which are um, going to produce less greenhouse gases. The other thing that's important in the work we do is, is trying to work out the relative contributions of the different breeds. Here you can see we've got 14 breeds. We can use the DNA to uh, help us with our genetic analysis, taking into account where uh, what breeds are involved in these crossbreds, or in this case, a composite herd that we use at the University of Alberta Research um, Ranch. So one of the things is trying to work out how good your predictions are. So we call them molecular breeding values, because remember that dairy example, they're based on the DNA sequence, they're not based on the phenotypes, although We've, we've done all, all of the phenotyping. So here you can see we've done the studies on 18 traits and we're developing good accuracy now. So accuracy sometimes doesn't translate, but um, that accuracy is the equivalent of having uh, generated 10 to 20 calves of these different traits. So very, very powerful. And then we do independent evaluation, uh, validation on a, a new set of animals from uh, new sets of traits. And, and we've done that with uh, carcass data from Cargill here and working with different companies, Beef Booster and Herd Tracks to do that commercially. So one of the uh, tools we've developed is, is what we call the feeder profit index. 
And this is something that we're working with um, different size of producers. We found the forage associations in Alberta are a, a great place to work with to, to get people interested in how to use this. We use 4-H clubs to, to sign up uh, people to, to test out this technology. You can see our index is based on different elements and it combines a hybrid vigor as well as um, uh, additive genetics. And let's see, I think, oh, no, I don't have it. I thought there was another part of this slide, it's missing. Anyway, we'll have to look at that graph on the right. You can see that for each 100 points in the index, um, then on average, the progeny generate $29 extra uh, income. And this is the, uh, the range of, uh, that we would typically see. So again, it's um, a nice way um, to get the technology adopted at the commercial uh, level, not at the, uh, the breed associations here, but helping commercial producers do a better job of, of managing their herd. So a little, a little bit thinking about new technologies, who's he eating what, when, and why. Those are some of the things we want to know. And here, so we can use GPS collars. We can use, as you just see a pedometer down here. We can use um, feeding stations or um, breathalyzers, green feed station here to measure methane emissions. This is a starling, by the way, not a, a wearable. Um, and so we can use drones to monitor the animals and use um, videos. For example, um, John Church at Thompson Rivers has been looking at respiration rate during heat events to, uh, to look at the uh, response of individual animals to uh, uh, heat stress. And these, these red and uh, yellow dots are um, high and low RFI animals that we had at uh, the Matheus Research Ranch in southern Alberta. And we found, you can see they don't, here they're overlapping, but in some of the paddocks or the, um, the, uh, the land where they are, they were segregating. So the uh, yellow animals are up here and the red animals are predominantly here. And we saw that animal, the more efficient animals generally were selecting a narrower diet. Um, which was interesting. So you know, that's something that we're, we're following up on in terms of um, can we, how is the selection for efficiency changing the use of the, uh, the pastures? So again, I've, I've run on, but uh, I think the challenge now is, is the phenomics part of omics, which is collecting all of this information, um, using sensors, using uh, particularly imaging, because you can, uh, you can get this information without um, being invasive. You don't need a blood sample. You can get information on those animals, but you can combine it with um, biomarkers that you can get from blood, for example, and you can look at all of these traits, which are really important for, for the industry going forward. And as I say, lots of, lots of uh, options. Here's a, a company that began in Scotland, Ice Robotics. Um, they have a variety of uh, monitors, which can look at, uh, they analyze the resting time of of animals, they can alert you to lameness, etc. Heat detection, many um, traits that you can measure. And here we have uh, another way of thinking about how animals look the same, in this case, sheep. And as more farmers, in this case, this was from Australia, start using uh, some of these new technologies, digital scales, um, moving animals in different ways, then a low cost method of identification is really, really important. And so they invested in sheep rate facial recognition. We're probably not so good at telling them apart, but uh, there are differences. And there's a very interesting company um, 
I think they're based in BC actually, but they, they also in Alberta, one cup AI who are using um, cameras to monitor uh, herds and they can do um, recognize the animals using AI and get information on those animals um, to plug into uh, these um, systems that we're putting together to, to uh, do the next generation of genetic improvement or animal breeding. Ag sites I mentioned, so their um, system is a management solution, so you can record your data on your animals anywhere um, whether it be at the when you're weighing them or um, um, mating them, etc. So another system this time, herd tracks, which uh, has been around for a while but is now part of Telus Agriculture. The uh, communications company again developing tools to track and identify the best animals um, to produce. Here's another example. This time from Ontario, a company called Transport Genie, and using these sensors to monitor all sorts of different things, and particularly during the transport of animals. So again, lots of opportunity. And as Arthur C. Clarke said, um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And nowadays we used to say, Genomics was just like that, you know, but how do we go from the genome to the phenome using uh, the Internet of Things? And that's one of the things that we're investing in a lot. So again, going back to that first example, which of these animals is um, healthy or more efficient? And this is uh, using infrared thermography. You can see they have a different heat pattern, these two animals. And when you measure uh, by traditional means the, um, the feed efficiency of those animals, then they're very, very different. So they look uh, similar to our eye, but using some of these technologies, we can get more information. Here's a gratuitous example of me using one of these cameras, uh, not just to, uh, to um, look at the thermal pattern, but in this case, to get a 3D image of the animal so we can predict its weight using machine learning. And uh, so we're building models, or the aim is to automate that analysis to capture a 3D model and to predict the weight of the animal or the body composition of the animal so we can, and ultimately to predict the carcass value of the animal. And uh, again, so this is what the multispectral camera that Alpha Phenomics have developed looks like, and it captures both the uh, 3D model, but also the, uh, the thermograph of the animal. And so a lot of our research is now supported by results-driven agriculture research in Alberta, but also federal funding from Kane to get these technologies to work for us. So the final message, it's all about data data collection, but also data sharing, as I mentioned, and learning how we can use these omics uh, technologies for us to uh, improve production and sustainability. So here's some of the people that uh, we work with. And uh, last slide, I think, because I've used my time, and you can recognize at least this individual here on the left, uh, a big group, but uh, lots of fun, lots of opportunity, and lots of excitement. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm trying to find you. There you go. I found the page. Good. Yeah, good. Thank you so much, Grant. Uh, if you have any question, either please uh, just unmute yourself and ask, or still you can just uh, write in the chat box and we can ask for Graham on your behalf. Hello, can I pipe in?
Yes, go ahead, please. Um, I wanted to tell Graham that I wasn't mad at him for his comments about dairy, perfectly understood and agreed with all of them. So it's all good. Um, so where do you see that going for, you know, what are some of the bigger challenges that you think, like you've talked about the technology and do you think that beef's going to get to the place where dairy is or where do you see all of this? Edit? That's a, a really great question. And um, I, I have to be careful because you're recording. Um, maybe I could, <laughs> maybe we I don't, could we don't share with the world. We don't have to, we can hide it somewhere. If you yeah, want yeah. To. Well, I'm not sure I should really tell you what I think, but the, um, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of my, uh, life in vertical integrated, uh, businesses uh, when I was in industry and, you know, it's, it's really important to get things to work, to, to build systems that work and the beef industry is, you know, I mean, that's why it's been successful. It's, it's the people who are in the beef industry have a way of working which, which doesn't necessarily fit with collaboration, if I can say that. So I would say the opportunities are there, but, but maybe we have to change the industry. And that's a huge job, right? So we're working at the ground level, which is I, I discovered this many years ago is, you know, people want to see that the technology works. And, and so we spend a lot of time um, demonstrating, if you like, that if, if you do, if we give you this information, we can predict which animals are going to stay in the herd. You know, you're going to do your selection, but we'll, we'll give you these values. I think one of the producers just said to us, uh, I can't remember exactly his phrase, but he was just amazed. You know, unfortunately, we gave him the results after he'd made his his uh, decisions, but he could have seen how how he would have been able to keep the animals that he, he, he should have kept if he'd had those results beforehand. I used to think we only needed to, to tell one or two people and they would do all the broadcasting for us, right? They would say, oh, you should work work with livestock gen tech it's it's marvelous but i generally find that everybody wants to see it work on their their property so that's a challenge i'm not sure if i answered your question yeah no and we we're talking a lot about tech adoption so i think that hits the nail on the head right it, it's there, it's so complicated to, I don't want to say persuade people to adopt technology, but for us as developers to develop the right technologies at the right times, at the right places, at the right cost, um, because as, yes. as technology becomes more and more available, farmers are inundated with opportunities to invest. And you have to be careful that um, you don't oversell because you could just spend all your money on technologies that don't have a return on investment, right? So I think... I think yes. that's um, that's really prudent for us to think about as as developers and as intellectual property managers. You know that we're paying attention to the marketplace as well. So yeah, I think I think sometimes re I mean research we're researchers, so we get excited by the technology, yeah. we get excited by the results, we get excited by the detail, but sometimes you don't need to tell everybody everything. Right. I, my favorite example, it's a very old one now, but we used to uh, in it's an example from the UK. Uh, it's probably similar here in to some extent in Canada is and it's a pig example. So there it's a it's a market is very uh, about lean meat. You know, we, we trained everybody to only buy pork that was um, had no fat in it. Right. It didn't yeah. cut necessarily very well but anyway that's what we fat was bad so that's what we did so um, the abattoirs paid for the leanest pigs and so we used genomics to be able to identify the best um, sires to to do that but we didn't need to tell them the detail what we did was we um, we benchmarked, if you like, the performance of the herd, the progeny that were coming through the barn. And then we said, well, switch, switch half your barn to this semen and see how you do. And 
they they knew the technology worked that was genomic selected semen because they got a bigger check from their yeah. abattoir. So that's all they needed to know, right? We're going to change your make system more money, <laughs> and you can make more money. So yeah, yeah exactly. Excellent. So think, thinking about what it is you're going to deliver to the the customer is probably the most important thing. Oh, that answers my question. Thank you very much. <laughs> good question, good answer. And we do have one compliment for you, Graham, from Paul. Uh, Paul is our colleague at, I think he's working on the soil management. And he's saying that uh, I have got to head out, Graham, but I really appreciate seeing how you implemented different technologies into your approach to measuring it. Very neat, Baker. Any other question or comment okay looks like there's no more question so then uh, if that's the case thank you so much Graham, for your time i really appreciate it and on behalf of my team julian and rim we really appreciate your time and thank you so much everyone for joining us today this is our last seminar but still if you have any people to nominate, please get in touch with us, then we can arrange for the next session. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I apologize for not being there. I'll make it one day, I promise. Sure. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye-bye.